God, and that is true. You reign. You are in charge. You are sovereign. You are Lord over all. And so we submit to you. We ask for your guidance in our life. I pray, I pray specifically for today as we open your word. I pray that we will submit to the Spirit's leading in our life and that we will follow you. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Well, we're glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're here. It's time to, time to open up God's word and to read. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. So if you want to grab a Bible and open them up, Galatians chapter 5. Chapter 5 is where we're going to pick up the read. Uh, and we're going to be uh, continuing in there uh, in, in Galatians chapter 5 talking about living a spirit-led life, our, our gift of our life back to the Lord. We come to Christ, we come to salvation, the free gift that God gives to us by grace through faith. Baptism is the moment in time when we receive that free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and the filling of the Holy Spirit. But what next? What do we do after we come to, to salvation? What do we do after that? What's the next step? And so we've been digging into Galatians chapter 5 where we see Paul specifically address some things that were to uh, remove from our life and in their place put in the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is a Spirit-led life. And so we're going to get into that here. Uh, and and let's, let's just do it right now. Galatians chapter 5, you're there. You're pretty good, pretty proficient at looking up. Chapter 5, verse 19. The acts of flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discords, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's let the Spirit lead our lives. And so today we're going to talk about two there from the list above. From verse 21. Drunkenness and orgies. The NIV uses the word orgies. The NLT uses wild parties, and so we'll use that one. Uh, as, as you look at these different words, the, the NIV uh, uses orgies, wild parties, excessive drinking, and sex. We already talked about sex a couple weeks ago. There in verse 19, at the beginning. We understand that God created sex to be enjoyed between a husband and wife. Anything outside of that is sin. Okay, so we're, we're not going to go back to that. But, but in all these different words, if you have the, uh, the NIV, it uses the word orgy. If you have the NLT, it uses the word wild parties. Anybody got the NLT out there? If you have the New American Standard, the NASB, uh, it uses carousing, drinking, lots of alcohol, and enjoying oneself loudly, uh, a, a loud party. If you've got the King James Version, it uses the word reveling, enjoying oneself in a live, noisy way, and drinking and dancing, and there's lots of alcohol, lots of partying, lots of bad choices. This is the common thread between these two. Drunkenness, wild parties. Losing control of yourself and making poor decisions. Losing control of common sense, losing control of, of, of who you are and, and what you normally would do and, 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 and going too far and living in a sin of excess where we throw, throw our normal self out and we let alcohol lead. So today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about alcohol. And I think this is one topic that I don't think all of us see eye to eye. But, but let's do this. Let's, let's agree with me here. Can we ask some questions? Can we look at Scripture says... And can we come to our own Christ-honoring decisions? Okay, let's do that. We've heard the stories. We've heard the statistics. We've heard the testimonies. We've heard them time and time again of the effect of alcohol. We've heard it so many times. Maybe you have a life that, that is one of those testimonies of the effect of alcohol, the effect of the addiction that it is. 
the effect of the, the wake of destruction that it left in your family, in your home, in your life. So I think if I simply put it, I think each of us has an individual unique story to tell about alcohol. There, there are some of us who've, who've been around alcohol and we look back and we remember the good times that have been benefited by it. Okay, maybe there are some in that category. I think that there are some in the category that look back at alcohol and see its path of destruction and see the pain that it's caused and see the family that it's destroyed and the lives it's taken. And the pain is real. You hate it. And then there are some in the third category. And maybe this is too simple, but just walk with me here on this. There are some in this story, and their unique story is that when it comes to alcohol, you're, you're a blank page. Because it's never been in your life. It's never been in your personal life. It's never been in your parents' life. And you've been protected from its destructive path. That's my story. That's a blessing that, that, that I, I'm, I'm honored. That, that, is, that it doesn't make me better than you. It doesn't make us, we're, we're different, okay? But that's my story. And so I can't stand here and, and look at alcohol and say it will never prove to be a, a benefit. I, I can't because I've never experienced Alcohol. I've never gone down that road. But at the same time, I can also say I've never experienced its destruction. I've never experienced the addictive power that it has. I've never lost control of myself to alcohol. And I praise God for that. And I'm okay. I'm okay. With not knowing the benefits, if there are, it seems like there are, because when I watch TV, everybody who's drinking, they're sophisticated and really good looking, and it makes everything so much better. And they have hair. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's good. Well-timed. And they have hair. But you know what? You keep the hair. You, 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 you keep all that, because the protection that I receive, because I never went there, is so much better. Okay, I, I, I'm looking at the two of them, and, and this, is, this is one of those, one of those topics in the Bible where, where my wife and I have prayerfully considered, and it is, it is our conscience that has chosen that we have, we, have, we have decided in our hearts to be complete abstainers from alcohol because that's our conscious choice. That's how we've chosen to honor God with our decision. And maybe that's not your choice. Okay? So we, we have to look at what the scripture says. We have to look at what the Bible says. And we have to know what is the best choice possible. Because each of us, and this is unique about, I don't think it's unique about alcohol. I think it's, I think it's true about a lot of things. Each of us are writing our unique story right now. But that story doesn't only influence your life. The story that my wife and I are writing right now is a story of abstinence from alcohol. And our children will grow up in a home that will never have a father that beats them in a drunken stupor. That's a blessing. They will never have a marriage that's destroyed by alcohol. That's a blessing. They will never know that. And so the story that I choose as a dad to write in my choices and say alcohol has no place in my life, that it not only affects my story, but it affects Kelly's story. And it affects Joseph and Anna's story. I think alcohol is a much larger circle of influence than just a privatized choice by an individual. And so let's go on this journey. Let's look at this journey. 
Let's look at what Scripture says. Let's, let's take an honest approach to this, and let's, let's be in Scripture about this. But first and foremost, let's be united as a church. I want to pray. I want to pray right now. I want to pray. God, I pray right now. I pray that as we look at your word, I pray for, for us as your, your brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that we can come to our personal convictions of what to do with our life in honoring you. And God, I pray for those who may be struggling with alcohol. God, I pray that you will free them from the chains of addiction. God, I pray that you will not, that you will, God, Satan wants to throw them under the bus. Look, we are all sinners saved by grace. We all sin in many different ways. And we all come to salvation through the same path, your son, Jesus Christ. And so let us all unite together as broken sinners, doing the best that we can to honor you. In your son's name we pray. And all the people said, amen. All right, so let's look at what this says. Okay, so Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 very specifically says here, you are not allowed to get drunk. No drunkenness. No orgies, no wild parties. That is is off limits. That is not acceptable. And in Christian churches, we have a slogan. Where scripture speaks, we speak. And where scripture's silent, we're going to be silent. And so if scripture specifically says something, then I'm going to grab the Bible, I'm going to stand up here, and in a place of authority, I'm going to say emphatically, You cannot get drunk, period, the end. Because Scripture speaks that way, and I can say that. But I cannot stand here in good conscience to say, you cannot drink socially. I can't say that. Because where Scripture speaks, I speak. And where Scripture is silent, I get to make up my opinion. No, that's not true. I don't get to speak in those places. We have to choose to honor God and our freedom. We have freedom in Christ to make the best choice possible. And so as we we navigate this road and we talk about this, I need to ask some questions. And the first question I want to ask is, can a Christian drink alcohol? Can you do that? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. Ephesians chapter 5, Galatians 5 here. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, go to the right one, one book. Paul writing again. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. There's a couple verses here in the Bible we could look at that talk about the destructive nature of alcohol that warn against us. But there are a handful that completely prohibit drunkenness. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, sin. So here's another repetition. Don't get drunk. Listen, you can't do that. That would cross the line. And so where scriptures speak, we'll speak. But instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm not allowed to get drunk, but instead I'm called to fill myself with the Holy Spirit, which is completely appropriate to what we've been talking about, filling our lives with the Holy Spirit. Out with that, in with this. Something, something better. And so can a Christian drink. You, you can, but you can't get drunk. And so this, this, this was mentioned to me the other day in a, um, in a quick argument to, to end all arguments. Someone brought this up, and they quickly referenced Jesus. Well, Jesus turned water into wine. John chapter 2, go there if you could. John chapter 2, John chapter 2, Jesus turned water into wine, and I think that's just fine, and if he's going to party, I'm going to party with Jesus, and we'll all get drunk together? What, what, what's going on? Because the person who references quickly threw John chapter 2 out, I had actually had two people reference this this week. One was a little more salty than the other. John chapter 2, verse 1, but it quickly went here, and I wonder if he remembered verse 11. Because sometimes I think we pick the verse that we like the most because it justifies our choices. I'll say that again. It sounded really good. We pick the verse we like the most because it justifies our choices. But we skip the purpose. We skip the context. John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. 
When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And Jesus responded, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Now time out. Okay, why is Jesus going to turn water into wine? A couple suggestions. Because Jesus wanted to drink. I don't think that's the answer. I think that was my friend's reasoning. I think he missed the point. Well, maybe Jesus had to turn water into wine because he brought his disciples and they weren't planning on that many people. Oh, Jesus is coming with all those people? We don't got food for all of them. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's because his mom asked him to. And Old Testament law required him to honor his mother. Maybe it's that. So Jesus tells him to, to fill him with water and the water turns into wine and, and they're so pleased and everyone brings out the best at the first and saves the best to last. But Jesus, you've done this amazing miracle. Skip down to verse 11. So Jesus does it. He changes water into wine. And listen, when I get to heaven, I'd like to think I'm going to have stern words with Jesus and say, why did you have to do that for your first miracle? But I don't think I will. But I really want to know exactly why. But I think verse 11 is the clutch. I think verse 11 is the entire point of this miracle. This miracle is only included in the book of John. And if you remember, John doesn't call miracles miracles. What does he call them? He calls them signs. Watch, chapter 2, verse 11. What Jesus did, did there in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Did you catch that? What was the purpose of the water to the wine? It was a sign. And why is Jesus doing signs? So that he could reveal his glory to his disciples. And why is he revealing his glory to his disciples? So that they would believe in him. The purpose of the water to the wine is not that Jesus wants to be the life of the party and then you've got to keep drinking. It's because he wants to authenticate himself and prove that he is the Messiah. My friend who threw this verse out as an argument finisher, I don't know if he remembered verse 11. I'm glad verse 11 is there because that was the purpose of Jesus' miracle there. So, so, okay, back to the question. Can a Christian drink? Yes, you can. Let me ask a different question. Should a Christian drink? Should a Christian drink? As we think about the Christian life, the Christian life is, is, is often uh, a, a choice between options, good, better, best. Let me give you an example. When you go to Walmart or, or a grocery store, you get a shop, shopping cart, right? Get your shopping cart. What do you do with your shopping cart when you're done? Uh, I leave it in the handicap stall. You do? Really? Because there's quite a few people that do. What do you do with your shopping cart when you're done? When you're done with your shopping cart, you have some choices. You can just leave it right there in the parking lot. It's not my responsibility. They pay somebody to pick this up. I'm giving him a job. You're welcome. Okay, that's one way to think about it. You could leave it there. You could push it to the shopping cart corral. Well, that's, that's, so so there's, there's well, you, I didn't even say that. You could have crashed it into the guy who was tailgating you on the way in. That's one option, okay? That's bad. And then we go to good. And then we go to put it in the cart. That's, that's better. You could take it back in the store. Well, that would mean I'd have to walk. Well, we're all dieting anyway, so it would help you out. Walk it back in the store, okay? So, so good, better, best. You could push it back in the store, and on the way back into the store, you could stop, and you could help that little old lady and take her shopping cart in with you too. Oh, man, that's going to be a lot of work. But that's the Christian life. What should you do as a Christian? That's not biblical. It doesn't say thou shalt take in your shopping cart and some little old lady's shopping cart too. It doesn't say that in there. This is to honor God with our freedom, to honor Christ with our freedom, and to think about what we're doing, and to ask the question, is this the best choice possible? Should I make this choice? Is this something that benefits my life? Does alcohol enhance and bless anything or anyone? Max Lucado, uh, Christian writer, he writes this, one thing for sure, I've never heard anyone say, a beer makes me feel more Christ-like. 
A beer never makes me feel more Christ-like. The fact of the matter is people don't associate beer with Christian behavior. Well, is that just a stigma that we need to get over? Or is that uh, something we, sh we should do? You think about your reputation, your reputation which can quickly be tarnished in a moment. I have to confess, I really struggle as a coach. As a coach of youth sports, I have to keep my emotions under control because quickly, one, just like that, a week later, I'm so mad at you, you said this and that, and you're a horrible representation of the church. It happens. I have to keep my emotions completely under control because I have a reputation. Because I, I want to represent Christ. I'm an ambassador of Christ and I want to do a really good job at that. And so if I'm in the police report, the DUI, I'm not, so don't look. But if that's your story, if you're in the police report as being in a drunken stupor in a fight and doing something else, poor choice, your reputation it goes down. Should we drink? Is it the best choice possible? Let me ask this last question. Why? Why do Christians drink? What is it? I mentioned earlier one quote that I saw as I was studying this, that liquor, liquor is the greatest enemy to marriage. I don't know if we can prove that or not. That's somebody's opinion. But why would I introduce the greatest enemy to marriage into my life, knowing that it could destroy my family for the positive side, the benefit that it tastes really good, the benefit that it's going to enhance some moments of my life, the, the possible benefits compared to the, the dangerous outcome? Why would I choose to do that? John Caldwell wrote in an article, let me be blunt, I see absolutely no positive argument for something that will make you act like a, a fool, smell like a brewery, fight like a fool, impair your motor functions, drain your bank account, give you a hangover, scare your children, alienate your spouse, make you a danger to your fellow men, and to potentially enslave you. Abraham Lincoln writes, alcohol has many defenders, but no defense. Many defenders but no defense. And so we say, no, listen, listen, I can control this. It's just going to be social drink. It's just going to be sophisticated wine sipping to improve my health. I can control this. But in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years from now, are you going to look back and say, I was wrong? Ken Eidelman, the uh, former president of Ozark Christian College, pastor in uh, Evansville, Indiana, says no one starts out to be an alcoholic. And, and I'm going to stop this quote and say, if that's your story, then my heart breaks for you. But remember, and I said this earlier, I, I want to repeat this. We are all, yeah, we're all slaves to sinful habits that we haven't kicked yet. You know, we're freed from sin in Christ, but we all have these sins that we keep coming back to. Your temper, your lying, your pride. Your choice to continue eating 10 donuts every morning because it tastes good. Okay, whatever it is, we all struggle in many ways. And my heart breaks for you, me, all of us because of the sinful choices that we continue to repeat. That's why I'm a preacher. So you come to know who Jesus Christ is and then work with the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome the sin in your and in my life. That's my point. Uh, Ken Eidelman, no one starts out to be an alcoholic. Everyone begins with a defensive attitude saying, I'm just a social drinker, and there's nothing wrong with it. No one says, it's my ambition that someday I will lose my job, my health, my self-respect, marriage, and family. Someday I want to be uh, uh, dependent on alcohol to, to get through my day. Yet this is the devastation which millions of people have arrived Our heart has to break, church. That we don't look with proud, arrogant noses at other sinners saved by grace. But that we come alongside of them and we support them. We say, listen, there's a better way. 
through the power of the Holy Spirit, let's, let's make the best choice possible. And so I look, at, I look at drinking and I wonder, why do Christians drink? Why do we drink? Why? And, and you, maybe we all, you all have, have a different answer to this question. But I sit here and I, and I look at it and I think, I wonder if it's to fit in. To fit in. That, that, that Christians fit in the peer pressure to be culturally relevant. But I'm reminded that as a Christian that we belong to Christ and that we're called to be different. That we belong to Christ and we're called to be different. Maybe, and I wouldn't doubt this, maybe that standing up here and sharing my testimony, that my testimony of being an abstainer, maybe that, that, that drives a wedge between you and I. And I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't. I hope that we can continue our friendship. But I wonder if people look at me and think, I don't know what they think. They just, simpleton. What's wrong with this guy? He can't handle his alcohol. I don't want to know if I can or can't. I don't want to try. But I wonder, I wonder if some of us, if, 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 I, if I started to drink to fit in, to, to fit in so I could be cool with my friends that are drinking because everybody else is socially drinking and I don't want to be the one left out. And so I'm going to fit in. I'm going to try to be like everyone else around me and I'm not going to be ostracized and I can handle this and I can do this and I don't think that's a wise idea. I think we're called to be set apart. I know we're called to be set apart, to be holy, to be different. But if this, this social drinking becomes the norm, then what's the difference between the church and the world? Look at the two standards. I think that the world would set the standard for alcohol. Social drinking is acceptable. Drunkenness is wrong. If that's the same standard that the church accepts, social drinking is acceptable, drunkenness is wrong, then what's the difference between the two? We're exactly the same. I'd like a choice to be, be different than the world. I'd like a choice where you could look at my life and you could see the fruit of the Spirit in my life, Galatians chapter 5. You could see the, the fruit of the Spirit in my life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I'd like you to be able to look at my life and see that in my life. Not because I'm better than you, but because the Holy Spirit lives in my life. And because the Holy Spirit lives in my life, I'm different. I'm holy because of what he's done in my life. So if it's to fit in, we have to, we have to abandon that. It's got to be something better. I wonder if people drink to medicate their pain. Drown their sorrows with the same thing that causes them. I think that's a lot. And, and, and as I ask that question, is it to, to pick you up, to help you function, to help you cope? I think we can expand that category to anything that, that becomes an addictive substance. I can't make it through the day without my coffee. All you people with coffee are like, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But, but if, we, if we look to it for our source of joy, we find our joy in the Lord. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to go there. Philippians chapter 4, we're in Galatians, or we were in John. Go back to the small books. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians chapter, we'll pick up the reading verse 3, and then we'll get to verse 4. If we have to look at something else, to give us joy. If we have to look to some substance, some, some emotional high, some, I gotta, I gotta do this to get me through the day, then I think we're missing the joy that the Lord provides. See, if we look at uh, Philippians chapter three, this is written by Paul, another letter written by Paul, and Paul's in prison when he's writing this letter. Chapter three, verse one. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I've not been locked up I pray I don't get locked up. I'm not breaking any crimes. Somebody's like astonished. No, I don't break crimes. But I can't imagine that if I was locked up, I would be an incredibly joyful person. I think I'd be pretty bummed out. But Paul's in prison. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Go over to Philippians chapter four. Chapter four, verse four. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice in the Lord. Even if you are in prison, continue to rejoice in the Lord. That's crazy, Paul. Listen, if I just wake up and I'm a little cranky, oh, it is... Game over. But Paul says rejoice always. Skip down to verse 12. I know what it is to be in need. 
and I know what it is to have plenty, meaning I've had bad days and I've had good days. I have learned the secret of being content in any and all situations, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul's saying, listen, I can go through bad times and good times. Through who? Through Christ. Paul finds his joy in the Lord. He finds his strength in the Lord. I need to pick me up right now. Well, remember the fact that you're loved and forgiven by our Heavenly Father. That he specifically looks at each and every one of you and knows that you're created in his image. He's knit you together. He knows your inmost being and he's passionately in love with you. That you're not an outsider. That you've been adopted into the family and he loves you. That should be a pick-me-up. Remember the fact that, man, I'm feeling low on my joy right now. Remember the fact that at once you were separated from God in your sins and his wrath was against you. But because of what his son did and because you received the gift of salvation, your sins have been forgiven and you've been made new in the Holy Spirit. That's good news. Let me unpack that. Your sins have been forgiven. You were in debt because of your sins. A massive debt, an unpayable debt. There's nothing you could have done to get rid of those debt, that debt. But Jesus forgave you of that debt. You were, you were sick in your sin. The worst sickness you'd ever had in your life and that sickness was going to lead to death and nothing you could do could heal yourself except for the Holy Spirit. And when you came to Christ, your sins were forgiven and you were made new in the Holy Spirit. That should give you a good pick-me-up. If you're down on your, and you're just, you're just having a bad day, remember the fact that, that Jesus said he's going before us to prepare a place. We're going to get to go to heaven one day. I don't, I don't know what's going on, but it seems I keep doing funerals every week. And it's just people that we care about and that we love. But the best part of the funeral is that each one, I get to talk about Jesus Christ. And I get to go to Revelation chapter 21 and talk about the fact that when we're there, there will be no more mourning or crying because the old order of things has been gone. And we will be with God and he will be with us and he'll be our God and we'll be his people and it will be good and we'll be at home in heaven. And so Christians choose joy because of what God has done for us. See, there's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is when you find 20 bucks on the floor, okay? That's happiness. Yay, I'm excited. Guess what happens to that 20 bucks? It goes away so quickly. Just poof, one kid, gone. There goes the money. Oh, well. Joy gets a flat tire and continues to persevere. Joy looks at James chapter 1 and says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing will develop perseverance and will mature you. Joy is a choice. It's a deep-rooted choice in what God has done for us, and it lasts. It's an abiding joy that's unfailing. It continues in our life. It continues in our life. And so we have joy because we choose joy. We don't have to look to anything else for joy. We look to the Lord for joy. And that is a learned behavior. That does not come easily. That's something that I need to work on as well. The last thing, we practice self-control. We practice self-control over all the sinful impulses and desires and temptations. In, in, in Galatians chapter 5, we were looking at some of the things that Paul said, stay away from this, but in its place, put this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we talk about alcohol, wild parties, we talk about self-control. Any substance that takes over our life and we can't live without it, any impulse, any desire, any temptation, anything that, that, that comes up and says, choose this path, the path of self-control, the ability to restrain ourselves and say, you know what, I'm not going to choose that path. I'm not going to take the instant gratification of going that route. I'm going to take the long, delayed satisfaction that finds itself in fulfillment later on. That's hard. If you've ever worked to, to pay down some financial bills, ever been there, working on paying off some financial bills, you got a couple and you got your budget, you made your budget with your spouse, you sat down and said, okay, this is bill number one, we're going to pay this one off, and when we get done with that one, then we're going to roll that bill payment onto number two, 
and we're going to pay that one off, and we're done with that one, then we're going to buy a boat. No, that's not the answer. Then we're going to pay off number three. And then when we get them all paid off, then we're going to live like no one else because we lived like no one else. And we're going to save our money, and we're going to give deeply, and we're going to have margin in our life. But first, it comes with self-control. And so when you get a little extra Christmas money, woohoo! No, check, bill collector, don't call me again. <laughs> Boom, drop the mic, it's paid off. Next. That's self-control. That's hard to do. But when we live a self-controlled life, we restrain ourselves and we say, nope, I'm going to honor God with my money. I'm going to honor God with, with my impulses. And so when it comes to alcohol, can we practice self-control? If the answer is no, then maybe we need to relook at whether we should drink or not. We have the biblical precedence, no drunkenness. We have the biblical precedence, put joy in your life, put self-control in your life, be different from the world, and you have a choice to make. Each and every one of you in this room will stand before a holy creator God who loves you a ton and is jealous for your attention, and you will respond to him, I chose to honor you by social drinking, or I chose to honor you by abstaining. Or I don't know. It's your story. If your story right now is, though, I absolutely, I've lost control. I've lost control. I, I cannot shake this habit. Know that my heart breaks for you. Know that I do not look down on anyone who, who struggles with sinful temptation each and every day. Because that's all of us, right? That's each and every one of us. Every one of us sin in many different ways. This church is made up of broken, messed up people. And I lead the charge. That's me. First on the list. Me. Sinner, sinner failure, me. But I'm forgiven by grace. That's your story too. That's your story too. All we can do is try through the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't let Satan throw you under the bus. Let me pray right now. God, I pray for us. I pray for us as your people. I pray for each and every one of us with the choice.